Good morning. We're going to get started uh, with Medicine Grand Rounds today. Um, it's really my pleasure to um, uh, welcome you to the 47th annual um, Jerome Flant's uh, Visiting Professor Lectureship. It's really our signature lectureship for the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine here in um, this historic Department of Medicine. I just wanted to say uh, a brief uh, uh, note uh, about uh, Dr. Jerome Flance, whose honor this visiting professorship was established. He graduated from Washington University School of Medicine in 1935, and he served his internship and residency in the Department of Pathology at Jewish Hospital, followed by residencies at Robert Koch Hospital, then the St. Louis City Tuberculosis uh, Hospital, and the Pneumonia Service at Harlem Hospital in New York. He actually returned to St. Louis and joined the clinical faculty here at Washington University, uh, where he became the director of the Washington University Pulmonary Service at St. Louis City Hospitals. In 1953, he initiated the uh, home care program at Jewish Hospital, serving for 11 years as its director and instituting a home care program for tuberculosis patients, the first such formal program uh, in the U.S. He also served as the medical director of the St. Louis Lung Association, president of the medical staff at Jewish Hospital, a member of the St. Louis Lung Physicians to Combat Air Pollution, and on our medical school's national council. I won't go into all of the details and his contributions to our community and our institution, but suffice it to say, he really uh, founded sort of what um, our division really stands for in terms of um, our, our commitment to our patients and to our community. And for that, we're so grateful that we have this visiting professorship in his honor and his legacy. And now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Paul Noble as our 47th annual Jerome Flance Visiting Professor here at Medicine Grand Rounds today. Dr. Noble is Professor of Medicine and Director of the Women's Guild Lung Institute and the Vera and Paul Guerin Family Distinguished Chair in Pulmonary Medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. He received his BA from Harvard, uh, Haverford College and medical degree from NYU, his internal medicine residency training at UCSF where he was chief medical resident. He pursued pulmonary and critical care fellowship at University of Colorado where he stayed on as a research fellow at National Jewish Center for Immunology and Respiratory Medicine. Uh, he was recruited to Hopkins as assistant professor of medicine where he was the director and founder of the ILD clinic. His career took off and he was recruited to become chief of pulmonary section at the VA in West Haven and associate professor at Yale, shortly becoming professor of medicine there. He then became chief of the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine at Duke and subsequently Chair of Medicine and Physician-in-Chief at Cedar sinai Medical Center, as well as Director of the Women's Guild Lung Institute. He recently stepped down as Chair of Medicine to focus on bringing together a world-class group of investigators in lung fibrosis. He's received received numerous awards and lectureships throughout his career, including the Sci American Thoracic Society Recognition Award for Scientific Accomplishment as member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Sandler Program for Asthma Research, permanent member of the LIRR Study Section, elected member of the ASCI and AAP, deputy editor for JCI, senior, senior editor for eLife, and the current president of the Association of American Physicians. He's a renowned physician scientist whose scientific career has focused on understanding the mechanisms of pulmonary fibrosis and how the lung defines the process of repair following injury. I would say that his initial work on hyaluronin fragments, inflammation, and the role of the hyaluron uh, receptor CD44 in the resolution of lung inflammation actually inspired me to pursue a research career and focus at the intersection of matrix biology and lung injury. 
we're delighted that he's here to speak about alveolar type 2 regeneration in the lung and pulmonary fibrosis. So please welcome Dr. Noble. Thank you, Dr. Lee. My, my mother would be very proud. Thank you. It's, um, it's, it's an incredible um, honor and privilege uh, to be here today. Um, the Department of Medicine at, at WashU is just iconic and, and legendary. Dr. Kipnis and all the subsequent chairs and Dr. Vicki Frazier is amazing. And um, early in my career, um, I came here like 25 years ago um, and I had my first R01 and I remember being scared to death because the pulmonary division here, John McDonald, Bob Sr., Bill Park, Steve Shapiro, um, Steve and I were young at that time, Brody, we were, um, and I remember presenting my work as like bringing Coles to Newcastle and um, coming back just brings back those extraordinary memories. Um, and also just being honored um, to give the Dr. Vance lecture. I got to meet Dr. Vance's daughter, Patty, last night, and we all kind of hoped to make a difference. He clearly made a difference, and so it's really an honor to be here and tell you, uh, I want to tell you a story. So fasten your seatbelts, um, because I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but there's just a lot I want to share with you. Um, so how do we get excited about, find, you got to find your passion. That's the key. It doesn't matter what it is but you gotta find what it was. And for me, it, believe it or not, it was when I was a junior resident um, at UCSF. Um, I was the junior resident admitting in the MICU, patient came in with respiratory failure. He'd had a bone marrow transplant you know, fairly recently. And unfortunately, he uh, went on to have respiratory failure, was, uh, was intubated, had a lung biopsy uh, on the ventilator. And this was his biopsy, which showed what we call diffuse alveolar damage. This is um, really ARDS. We saw, uh, we saw more of this during COVID as a kind of a recurrence of that. And unfortunately, this gentleman uh, went on to succumb to, to respiratory failure. No identifying reason was identified. And he had an autopsy. And this was what his lungs looked like. He just formed, over a relatively short period of time, dense scar. And I became really interested in, you know, why would that happen? Why would the lung form scar tissue, you know, without um, any clear underlying cause? And during my chief residency year, we had a new lung transplant, or a new bone marrow transplant program at UCSF at the time. And, um, of course, looking back, this was undoubtedly the chemotherapy regimen. We didn't have, this was before Dr. John DiPercio did all of his incredible work over the last several decades, so this doesn't happen anymore. But, the, but I got fascinated in why does the lung form scar tissue? And I've been chasing that question ever since. And um, the other little vignette I want to tell you is it's, it's really, it's all about the patients. And I want to share this story with you because it's incredibly informative uh, for, for those of us that are obsessed with interstitial lung diseases. So when I left my fellowship, as Dr. Lee said, and started the ILD clinic at, at Johns Hopkins, this gentleman came to see me 30 years ago. He was a pediatrician um, and uh, ironically worked on vaccine development back before it was as fashionable as it is now. And he came to see me, otherwise was fine. Bad lung function, uh, bad DLCO, and he was on supplemental oxygen. Um, and, uh, and we, at that time, circa sort of 1994, you know, 1995, he had a chest cat scan. I don't have it from then. I'll show you one, though. And it was fibrotic, scarring lung disease. And um, we worked him up for autoimmune disease circa 1995. Everything was negative. At that time, um, the only real lung transplant program in that area was University of Pennsylvania. And I referred him there you know, for an evaluation. And so it be initiated treatment circa 1994 for what I believed was uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. He had a lung biopsy, I looked at it with a pathologist, Dr. Fred Askin, who's a legend in lung pathology. And at that time, having come out of the University of Colorado, what we believed IPF was a disease, really almost like autoimmunity, chronic inflammation. So what we would do is we would treat patients um, with aggressive immunosuppressive therapy. And um, this is actually his chart that he kept. 
So he was going south. Um, as I said, I referred him to the University of Pennsylvania, failing steroids. And at the time, what we did was we used uh, immunosuppressive therapy, either azathioprine or, or, or cytoxin. I trained with Dr. Talmadge King and Dr. Marvin Schwartz, and they didn't want to do what Dr. Ganesh Raghu did in Seattle, so we gave cytoxin rather than the azathioprine. We now know this does more harm than good. But at the time, this is what we thought. This is a tincture of time. But look what happened, shockingly. He kind of got better. And this is why I think some people believe their immunosuppressive therapy had a role until it was proven not to. And then I moved to Yale in 1997, and maybe I got a postcard from him. And then I'm sitting in my office in Los Angeles in 2016, and I get a phone call from Dr. Anthony. I'm like, Bud, you're alive? And he said, yeah, I just retired out here in Camarillo. Can I come see you? And I'm like, yes, only if we can get a CAT scan and lung function. And so he, this is his CT from 2016. Look at the bottom of his lungs, particularly here. The bottom of his lungs are completely destroyed, completely destroyed. Despite that, his lung function was essentially normal. What is going on? I said, bud, what happened? He goes, you know, it's a really funny thing. Maybe 10, I can't remember, 15 years after you treated me, I was diagnosed with Sjogren's disease. The lung can be the first manifestation of an autoimmune disease. And in certain circumstances, immunosuppressive therapy works for fibrotic lung disease in the, sen in the setting of autoimmunity. What does that mean? By chance, we treated the underlying cause. And that's gonna be a theme I'm gonna return to. And here we are celebrating his 92nd birthday in clinic. And actually, on Sunday, I'm driving out to go see he and his wife. Uh, he's, um, you know, we, we, um, he's, he's not getting any younger. And, I, and, I, and he's just a wonderful man. But I think about this, on Tuesdays and Fridays when I see my Aldi, I'm looking at the CT and I'm like, is, is this going to be a Bud Anthony? Should I think about him? You know, and we don't know prospectively how to do that. It's one of the many fascinating things. Fibrosis is the last frontier. There isn't an organ in the body that isn't impacted by fibrosis. I, of course, am interested in the most important organ, the lung. But, but many of you in the room probably have other interests. So the key thing, the single most important thing, um, is making an accurate diagnosis. My best days are always when somebody comes to me, referred by another pulmonologist, and, they, and I said, so what's going on? Well, I have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They have this sour look on their face because they've Googled IPF. If you Google IPF, it's really pretty dismal what it tells you. And my best day is always when I tell them, actually, you don't have IPF. So you've got to make that right diagnosis because it changes management. And it really boils down to really three things. Is this lung disease just the lungs, or is it part of a bigger picture, either something you were breathing in, or some systemic disease where the lung is a bystander? Is that systemic disease trying to reject your lungs? It sounds like an easy question, but I've been doing this for 30 years, and it actually isn't an incredibly easy question. Um, the most common uh, autoimmune diseases that cause major lung disease are rheumatoid arthritis and, and scleroderma. Aside from those patients, and RA is, is not unlike Sjogren's. I've had many patients over the years that present with fibrotic lung disease, and then the joint disease comes years later. It's, it's really fascinating. But then there are less common ones. And my favorite disease in the world is the antisynthetase syndrome. I think it's enormously underdiagnosed. And it's very, very treatable most of the time. And then this world that I live in, um, and it's, it's patients that come in and they have what I like to call an undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Meaning when I send them to my, my rheumatologist, and I've had the honor and privilege of working with great rheumatologists over the years at different institutions, they can't check off enough boxes to get a rheumatologic diagnosis. And you know, I'm not actually that interested in the boxes. What I'm interested in, do I need to treat this like a systemic disease or not? And this is really, I think, one of the most exciting frontiers in fibrotic lung disease, determining whether there's an underlying rheumatologic disease or is that anti-coup 
of medium intensity a false positive. These are the challenges that we don't really understand. And IPF is a disease that affects men more often than women, usually a two-thirds to three-quarters to, to ratio. Um, and it's a disease of aging. The other is chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And my time in Los Angeles, uh, there's something I think about the spores and it being 72 and sunny and there's you know, never any humidity. It's an epidemic uh, in Southern California. And trying to distinguish chronic HP from IPF is enormously challenging. Occult aspiration and then drugs. Drugs can do it, but less common. Age and gender are probably the most important things. If I can really answer two questions, how long has this really been going on for? And is it just limited to the lungs? I can make great progress. But age and gender matter. IPF, as I said, is largely a disease of older men, whereas the autoimmune diseases are much, much more common in women. I would go so far as to say, if you see a 60-year-old woman with fibrotic lung disease, she could have IPF, but it's much more likely there's an autoimmune disease brewing in there. This is a patient of mine who has fibrotic disease in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. It can be a devastating disease. Other times, it's quite manageable. There's a spectrum. Chronic HP, birds, molds, and feathers. People in Los Angeles are obsessed with birds and feathers. I'm not quite sure why. But, but finding it, I, I, I've had these patients, I love to tell this story. You'll be sitting there with the spouse, and one of them will have bird feathers on them. They're like, eh, I don't have any birds. Because they know, deep down, the birds are causing the disease. And many times, they'd rather get rid of the spouse than get rid of the bird. So it's a fascinating. But this, so the high resolution, if you're on that desert island, and you have one test to order, it's the high resolution chest cat scan for ILD. And I love to see this. This is what we call mosaic, mosaicism or air trapping. Expiratory images are so important. You guys have all world radiology here. You're lucky. Um, but get those expiratory images. Because when you see this, it's really unlikely that it's IPF. And at the end of the day, that is the most important question. Is this IPF or is it not? This is IPF. Um, or what we call usual interstitial pneumonia. Um, it's a fascinating term. Actually came out of Yale. There were these legendary pathologists in the 60s that reviewed autopsies and biopsies of everybody that had fibrotic lung disease for no clear reason. And the pattern they saw under the microscope, they brilliantly called usual. It stood the test of time, although it's not a great term. But you can see this pattern in RA. But this honeycomb, you can almost see that little bee trying to pop its head. Out of, the, out of those holes, this is subpleural honeycombing. And if you biopsy the lung, we don't do this as often as we used to, but over the years I've looked at thousands of biopsies on all my patients. And it's this peculiar pattern, if you will. You have to have normal lung in there, and then you have this dense collagen. So ironically, to have this disease that really has a mortality worse than most cancers, you have to have normal lung in there. And one of the interesting things about where I practice in Southern California, kind of the edge of, of, um, of, of um, West Los, or of the ed edge of um, kind of Hollywood and Beverly Hills, every time somebody sneezes, they get a CAT scan. So one of the things you start to see a very early disease. This is what IPF looks like in what we call a preclinical stage. And if you biopsy it, this is what you see. Normal lung scar, and this is the holy grail. What I'm going to tell you in the next 37 minutes, two things. One is the overlying alveolar epithelium is sick in IPF. I believe that's the underlying cause. And then what happens, and as a consequence of this sick epithelium, this thing grows. Doesn't that look like a little tumor? This bud of mesenchymal cells are growing. And I'm going to tell you about a group of cells that we think might be driving because the goal in life is to make this go away or at least prevent this from looking like this. So this is a patient actually that I took care of as a fellow and IPF, is, it remains a fatal disease. Most patients succumb within three to five years. It is fascinating a disease of aging. It's uncommon for IPF to occur under the age of 60, unless it's a familial form. But it's, it's um, in my world, it's an epidemic, but it's not an uncommon disease, much more common than cystic fibrosis. There are two FDA-approved drugs, um, but despite that, 
most patients still progress and succumb or get a lung transplant. And the lung transplant remains uh, really the only option for long-term survival. It can go fairly quickly. This is a patient of mine that just recently had a lung transplant. Over two years, you can see the, the um, extensive scarring. So there are two FDA-approved drugs. I was very fortunate to be involved um, with both of them, more so with profenadone. It was a true honor. Dr. Talmadge King was my clinical mentor. I saw patients with him in clinic. He's, of course, the legendary dean at UCSC now. And so he, he and I were the drivers on this, and then I was also involved in intended it. But 10 years later, IPF remains a disease that has a prognosis worse than most lung cancers. So this, um, you guys, of course, have the legendary Dr. Alex Patterson here. And, and Dan Kreisel's not here. He emailed me. He's an amazing uh, surgeon scientist. But this is pretty cool. This is a minimally invasive lung transplant. Dr. Pedro Caterino came to our place. Uh, he had trained at Duke and then was in the UK. And we, and we have seen a, an extraordinary, it's been very satisfying for me as an IPF doctor because when I got there, we did like 120 heart transplants, but I was hard to convince the surgeons that there was another organ in the chest. And so finally, we've been able to do that. And we, we, last year, we did 82 transplants, a number of them with this many, minimally invasive approach. But why do I care? Not only do I want to give my patients great care, I want the lung tissue. So we get the lung tissue. Everything I'm going to tell you in the next 34 minutes is based on what we've learned from my patients who've undergone lung transplant. So this is what happens. We have the beautiful normal lung, and this is what the lung looks like when it comes out. Dense collagen, but it's also destroyed. I'm going to come back to that idea. So the lung has a simple job. Get the air, get oxygen from the air into the blood. And in that beautiful distal alveolar space, there are two types of lining cells, br brilliantly called type 1 and type 2. The type 2 cell, of course, makes surfactant. Surfactant is like that bubble. That's a hysteresis, so the lung can open and close. But more importantly, what the type 2 cell is, it's the stem cell in the distal alveolar space, and it makes the type 1 cell. The type 1 cell is how we get oxygen from the air into the blood. And um, for the ILD folks, you know how you see those patients who have relatively normal lung volumes, but their DLCO is maybe in the 50s? We always say, oh, it must have coexistent pulmonary hypertension. I think that's not right. I think the DLCO is a surrogate for the loss of type 1 cells. So my hypothesis is that if we can fix this problem of type 2 cells dying, we will see an impact on the DLCO. It's a hypothesis. So when I was at Duke, uh, we were fortunate to have the JCI. And, I, and we, we published this idea at the time. It's over a decade ago. This idea that the, the alveolar type 2 cells, it wasn't our idea. But, but we were one of the folks that were trying to push this idea that the type 2 cells don't work right, that they prematurely age, and then all downstream consequences happen. One of the things I was most proud about during my time at Duke was that I got an all-world brilliant National Academy of Science PhD scientist who was a world's, probably the top lung developmental biologist, Dr. Bridget Hogan. And I got one of my pulmonary fellows to go into her lab. It took a lot of negotiating. She wasn't wild about an MD fellow at the time. But this was um, Dr. Christina Barkaskis's first paper, the cover of the JCI. Not bad. What they were able to show, Brian remembers Christina very well, and um, what, what, she, what, what, what they were able to do was isolate type 2 cells from the mouse, label them, put them in a little gooey dish with some feeder fibroblasts, and grow a lung. So from these isolated type 2 cells, you see staining for type 1 cells. So this was the first demonstration that the alveolar type 2 cell was the stem. And this is the assay. Forming a lung in a dish, this is the assay that I'm going to show you. And what we were able to show um, a few years back now is that in IPF, they can't do this. We isolate the type 2 cells from the explanted lung. They can't form a lung in a dish. There's a tremendous loss of type 2 cells. There's a dramatic decrease in the number of type 2 cells. And this is the assay I'm going to show you. This, this is the area, but the colony forming efficiency. This is, before I hang up my cleats, what I am hoping to find out is if I can fix this 
Will it impact the natural history of this deadly disease? So this is the diagnostic test for IPF. It's actually better than a high resolution CAT scan, but you can't get it on your patients. This is what we get out of that explanted lung. This is a single cell analysis. And what you see here in green are our beautiful, normal type 2 cells. And in this pinkish color are the type 1 cells. And look what happens in IPF. There's a tremendous loss of type 2 cells and type 1 cells and expansion of these other basal cells. We're not going to talk about those, but there's a lot of people interested in that. So the question we asked, why? Why? Why are these type 2 cells going away? And so isolating these cells, doing then single cell analysis and looking at what genes were expressed agnostically, we said, what's different? And unexpectedly, what we found was that there was dysregulation of zinc metabolism. I can assure you, I never imagined I would be thinking about zinc. Okay? And so it turned out that this zinc transporter turns out zinc transporters are important, is missing in IPF. And there, as I'll show you, there's a bunch of them. But this one called ZIP8 is expressed in type 2 cells and type 1 cells in the IPF lung. And there is a dramatic loss in IPF. And as I said, there's a lot of them. They're redundant. But ZIP8 is the key one. And it's expressed almost exclusively in the alveolar cells, the type 1 and the type 2 cells. And it's on the cell surface. And there's a loss. Not, what's interesting, though, is not all of the IPF type 2 cells don't have a zinc transporter. What's fascinating, in the normal lung, it's like a 2 thirds, 1 third ratio. And it's reversed in IPF. But if you don't have the zinc transporter, whether you're normal from a normal lung or from an IPF lung, you can't form a lung in a dish. So you need this cell surface zinc transporter. Um, but as if you don't have the zinc transporter, you can give them all the zinc in the world, and it won't matter. Interestingly, if you take a normal type 2 cell and you actually give them zinc, those third that have the zinc transporter work harder, and you can increase colony formation. But if you don't have the zinc transporter. So giving zinc isn't the answer. But what is the consequences? What happens to these sick type 2 cells if they don't have this zinc transporter? So looking at downstream signaling pathways, we stumbled upon these proteins called sirtuins. I can honestly tell you, I never imagined I would be thinking about sirtuins. But sirtuins are fascinating proteins that are thought to be involved in longevity, in health span. In C. elegans, there are papers suggesting that sirtuins regulate the lifespan of an organism. Very fascinating area. So what we found unexpectedly, that these sirtuin proteins, that they, they post-translationally modify other proteins, um, and they, but they require metabolism. I'm going to explain that in a little more detail. But basically, in, in, the, um, in the IPF, Isolate, freshly isolated type 2 cells, there is a tremendous loss of sirtuin gene expression. And it's interesting. If you look at the cells that have the zinc transporter versus those that don't, sirtuin 1 expression is missing in the cells that don't have that cell surface zinc transporter. And there are these purported activators, also a very controversial area, sirtuin activators. These are things that you can obtain commercially. And what's interesting, is in both healthy, but more importantly, in my patients, if you titrate in this sirtuin activator, you can increase organoid formation. But, and if you block their inhibitors, uh, it's, it's a little bit unclear how precisely specific these are, but they will inhibit a normal type 2 cell from forming organoids. What's also interesting, and this allows us to do other experiments, because you can't do everything on isolated human cells. Old mice, not young mice, old mice injured have a similar signaling pathway, that uh, the sirtuin pathway is, is down-regulated in old injured mouse cells. So to get these, paper, these things into journals we like to publish in, you got to do many things many ways. So we knocked it out. So if you knock out 
the ZIP8 transporter in the adult type 2 cell of the mouse what happens. So what's interesting is they can't recover from lung injury. If you injure the mouse with bleomycin and you look at that period of recovery, the ability of the type 2 cell to uh, regenerate is impaired. And what's fascinating, IPF is a slowly insidious disease. And what's interesting in these mice, over nine months to a year, where they will spontaneously develop fibrosis. They are very susceptible to lung injury. So this encourages us that this mouse model may recapitulate some aspects of the human disease. But what's really interesting is that if we restore this pathway, we can see some interesting impact on organoid formation. So if we take old, injured type 2 cells from the mouse and we titrate in zinc, I'm going to explain why NAD is important, and this sirtuin-1 activator, we can regenerate these old, sick mouse type 2 cells. But more importantly, in my patients, if we use this cocktail, if you will, we can significantly improve colony formation. So I always love it. You publish a paper, and the commentary is way better than the paper. This is like worth looking at because it takes about 10 minutes. The paper's dense and, you know. But this is this, so we identified this pathway, sirtuins, NAD, and this zinc transporter as maybe being important. So this encouraged us to delve deeper. So we looked in more detail and um, it, it, in terms of the um, NAD metabolism. And it turns out that genes involved in NAD metabolism are dramatically downregulated in IPF. These are other people's work. And in particular, when it, it turns out, and I had a little um, you know, PTSD from those Leninger days. You know, I thought the second year of med school I'd never have to really think about biochemistry. But um, NAD is really important, and there's three ways to make it. Um, there's the uh, de novo synthesis, the priest handler pathway, and then the salvage pathway. So the salvage pathway involves this enzyme called NAMPT. And it's critical if we, so what's fascinating also, there's too many circumstances here. So with aging, IPF goes up. With aging, our NAD levels drop. Could be true, true, and unrelated, but it's interesting. And what we found in IPF was this enzyme that's critical for maintaining NAD homeostasis is dramatically down-regulated. At the gene, at the protein level, and then when we stain our explant tissue, the NAMPT enzyme co-localizes with type 2 cells and it's down. And it's also down in our old injured mouse lungs. So there are enzymes, there are, are I'm, I'm sorry, there are molecules that will inhibit uh, NAMPT. And if we take our normal mouse or human type 2 cells, and we titrate in this inhibitor of this salvage pathway, they can't form organoids as well. And so we knocked it out in, and we haven't published this, this, uh, this chapter yet because we're, we're trying to get it just perfect for, for a journal that we really want to publish in. And so we knocked it out, and what happens? They can't form organoids at all, even more powerfully than the ZIP-8 transport. And it, this doesn't seem to be directly downstream of the zinc pathway. It's like another way to impair energy metabolism. And if you um, injure these mice, they die at a much greater rate. And what's fascinating, and this is opening up this chapter I'm really excited about, there are activators of this enzyme, several of them. And if we take normal or type 2 cells, and we titrate in these activators, we can increase colony formation. And what really gets me excited is that if you look at these three different, three different compounds, they restore colony formation to the level of healthy type 2 cells. Now, this is in the laboratory, but it's really, really interesting to think about. And so if you add in a little substrate, and the enzyme, you can further increase colony formation. And if we pretreat the mice prior to injury, 
and then injure them, look at what Dr. Lee likes, the acute lung injury, you can fix those type 2 cells in the early phases. And if we pretreat, you can prevent fibrosis. But I have to tell you, we've cured IPF in the mouse a million times. It doesn't translate to patients. But what's exciting is that if you let the fibrosis establish, and then you use this, this a small molecule activator, you can help resolve the fibrosis. So that's exciting. But the other piece, again, circumstantial evidence. It's been known for three decades. The, uh, the lung of the IPF patient has enormous increases in oxidative stress. Inhaled glutathione has been tried, N-acetylcysteine. People have been perplexed what is going on with oxidative stress. Well, it turns out, if you look at IPF type 2 cells, or cells that have had this enzyme knocked down, there is a tremendous loss of oxidative stress genes. So SOD2, thought to be the main oxidative stress gene in the lung, is dramatically downregulated. And, and these transitional cells, which I won't talk about, seem to get upregulated. And what's fascinating is if we take our sick IPF type 2 cells and we treat them with this activator, we can restore the oxidative stress. We have seahorse experiments I don't want to bore you with. But we can restore the oxidative stress gene expression, and we can restore mitochondrial function. And this is really, for me, the holy grail. If we take these sick type 2 cells, we can get them to express type 2 cell genes. But more importantly, we can get them to express type 1 genes. Can we restore the ability of the sick IPF type 2 cell to not only regenerate, but make type 1 cells. That's the hypothesis. And this, is, and this effect is dependent on NAMPT. So in our type 2 cells that we've knocked it out in the mouse, um, the activator doesn't work. So it's specific for that. So our hypothesis here is this aging disease leads to exhaustion of IPF type 2 cells. And so this part, I'm going to tell you the last part very quickly because I just can't help myself. So the accurate diagnosis matters. IPF remains the leading cause of lung transplant. Look at CF. Janet and I were talking about There's been a tremendous decrease in the number of, of CF patients that need lung transplant because they're treating the underlying cause. Type 2, two cells are the stem cell. The underlying cause of IPF, we believe, is the premature failure. And this NAD homeostasis is dysregulated. So the hypothesis that we're trying to test um, is that can we, if we restore this pathway, can we change the natural history of the disease? But the other story I want to tell you is related to this destroyed fibrotic lung. The idea sort of came to me a, a, about 15 years ago. You know, IPF, it just clinically, it's more like a cancer than it is a chronic inflammatory disease. And a lot of people have been talking about this. And we wondered, is there a subset of fibroblasts that may, maybe they Maybe making collagen isn't the whole answer. But in fact, is there a subset of cells that sort of take on more of a cancer-like phenotype? They, could they potentially be like a metastatic cell? For tumors to metastasize, they got to chew through the basement membrane and get to the bloodstream. So we addressed this initially in the mouse. As Janet mentioned, I was, I was fascinated early in my career with this glycosaminoglycan called hyaluronin, because it's in the IPF lung. And this is a myofibroblast. And these myofibroblasts overexpress this enzyme, hyaluronin synthase 2. And what we did was we got a mouse that had this enzyme downstream of an alpha smooth muscle actin promoter. And we injured the mice, and they died miserably. And this is the thing that got me excited. In the, the BLEO model, you know, the injury gets scarring, but it generally gets better. These mice died of progressive fibrosis, and they had destroyed lung. Is, and what we were able to show in this JX Med paper was that there, these cells, these fibroblasts that we think are driving it, would spontaneously chew through matrix. You put them on top of this goo, and they chew through to the bottom. And in our IPF patients, there was a subset of these cells that spontaneously chewed through matrix. So what we've been trying to figure out is why. And can we disarm these guys? And so we were able to show if we knocked down that, that enzyme or the cell surface receptor, it worked. 
So then um, when I moved to Los Angeles, I was able to recruit this great PhD scientist, Corey Hogaboom. And Corey came from the University of Michigan. He developed this, this humanized model of IPF, where he can take IPF cells from the explanted lung or from biopsies, and you can squirt these human cells into an immunodeficient mouse. And what happens is that those cells will migrate to the lung and form scar tissue. And our first experiment was really to literally scrape these cells that chewed through the matrix down here, put them in, in compare. These are all IPF fibroblasts. So the ones that had the ability to chew through the matrix formed more scar tissue, suggesting that they may be more potent in that effect. So we just initially looked what's missing, you know? Bulk RNA-seq on these really, these cells that we isolate. We can now, we've identified cell surface markers, we can flow sort them. But in the early stages, but again, I never thought that I would, think, would, would, would be thinking about this. But what we found unexpectedly was that a, 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 one of these immune checkpoint ligands was upregulated on these invasive cells. And this idea, you know, that obviously with a cancer cell expressing this ligand hides from the immune system. And then if you target that pathway, can you activate the immune system to kill the cancer cell. Could there be a similar concept in the in IPF? Now, keep in mind those those uh, those um, invasive cells that we squirt into the mouse. It's an immunodeficient mouse, so that mouse doesn't have a doesn't have an immune system. But what we found was that we could demonstrate, um, you know, at this at the protein level that there's a subset, but it's only about a quarter or a third of the. It's not all the fibroblasts. And these are from the explanted lung. So these are very sick patients. But these cells are more fibrogenic. And in vitro, they migrate more and they invade more. And the, the antibody, uh, the, the anti pd one antibody, it will inhibit that. And if we knock it down in, in normal cells, they can't invade the matrix. And in Corey's model, both if you pre-treat with the antibody, or more importantly, if you, if his model takes 35 days, but if you let the fibrosis establish and then you treat with the antibody versus the control here, you can see a, a significant resolution. So this encouraged us to try to, to, to develop this for patients. And in fact, Genentech has sponsored a phase one study. I just enrolled one of my patients um, uh, on Tuesday in this study. It's been tough to enroll because as all of you pulmonologists know, one of the major complications in cancer of, of immune checkpoint inhibition is pneumonitis. So, um, so, so far, at we've, we were now up to about to enroll our sixth patient. Um, but testing this idea that if we can target these cells, could we change the outcome? And what's interesting and what encourages me to continue in this area is we have two spontaneous fibrosis models. My colleague Barry Stripp published this a few years ago that this molecule called SYN3A is a, is a regulator of progenitor cell function. And when he knocked these out um, in type 2 cells, you get spontaneous fibrosis. And I've already shared with you our ZIP8 story. But what's exciting to me is if we take these mice lungs and we just spontaneously look, these invasive cells develop in, these, in this spontaneous model. So what my hope is in, the, in the, this sort of next chapter of my career is to understand why this is happening and to see if we can identify new therapeutic options. So we have the phase one study, and Dr. Tenzira Zaman is also, or we've also organized a uh, proof of concept study with the zinc and the NAD booster. The fascinating thing about this is all of those things I talked about, those components, they're all available as supplements. So I get like three emails a day from people around the country. Should I be taking these supplements? I have no idea and I have no financial benefit, but it's interesting to think about. But test, we're hoping to test it. Um, so the summary, diagnosis matters. The type two cell, I believe, is the holy grail. But is there a subset of fibroblasts that these fibroblasts make less collagen that have this other function that's driving it. And there are new therapies on the horizon. It's all about patients. This is me making a house call uh, to a patient of mine who lives in Malibu. 
He's, he's by definition of winning the game. We're 10 years in with an, un, I won't tell you what autoimmune disease, but on the cocktail that I have him on, he's doing well and has not needed a lung transplant. And then this is one of my patients that he was 75 at the time with one kidney. And we got him a, a single lung, um, and he's now eight years out. And um, so if I, can fix, if I can prevent lung transplant, I win the game. But if we have to go down the lung transplant route, then we do that. Um, and I've been fortunate over the years to have great collaborators. And so far, the NIH has been supportive as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. David. <laughs> so um, it's a great, it's actually an incredibly great question. As I've learned, as I've delved into this murky world, there's incredible competition amongst like former big league scientists who sell science nature papers about NR, which is another precursor, or NMN. Um, and, um, you know, this is why we want to do the study. But I, I can tell you there are a lot of patients that are taking it. And, and it might be some rationale. This gets into biochemistry, which you know, is uh, there might be some rationale to take NMN more so than NR because of the way, you know, it gets absorbed and things like that. But that's kind of, you know, if we can get the activator and the precursor, you know, can we really goose these type 2 cells to, to, uh, to regenerate uh, more properly? But yeah, no, I, I think it's, um, I mean, I'm biased, but I, I think it's really an exciting area to develop. And then the second question is, should you be skeptical in activating type 2 cell regeneration? Is there a good mechanism now to get rid of the things that I've So that's a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm, I'm buoyed by my patient that I showed you because um, despite the fact that he had extensive scar tissue, the rest of that lung did okay. So my belief is that as long as you have a reasonable, some amount, I mean, we know if you do a lung transplant, you give one lung, patients you know, are fine, that that residual, that, that lung can, can restore that. We know that these invasive fibroblasts retard type 2 cell regeneration. So if we can eliminate that signal, not only to make collagen and destroy tissue, but also retard the type 2 cell function, can the lung repair itself? My belief is that it can. But you need some lung left. Yeah. Steve. Right, it's a great question. Actually, I started out as a macrophage person. That's uh, that might, because at that time, what came out of the NIH in the 80s was that uh, macrophages were making growth factors. Growth factors were telling fibroblasts to make collagen. What's telling the macrophage? So I'm, I'm excited. The macrophages that we get out of these spontaneous models promote the invasive phenotype. So, but I do think the interplay of immune cells and this biology um, you know, is really, really important. It's limited what you can do in the mouse and that explanted lung. I mean, there's tons, there's all these lymphoid, I mean, how much is end stage lung versus driving the process? But there are a number of, of people, great scientists who are working in this area. But I do think, and what we, you know, obviously with the immune checkpoint, it, it, one of my patients who's in, she's, I wanted, I told her to send me a picture. She's traveling in Europe now, you know, which I take as a really good sign, you know. Um, but we don't have any way to really assess the lung afterwards, you know. But I think it's a great question. Yes, sir. Oh, great, great questions. So um, I'm really fortunate that um, 
we were able to recruit two scleroderma mavens, one from UCSF, Francesco Boyne, and then Nunzio Bottini, who's a, who works on scleroderma. He's a, he's a, a, pro, he's a, um, he's a phosphatase guy. And so we're just starting to look uh, at scleroderma, but here's the problem. And this goes back to when I was a fellow. People were, the skin and the lung are not the same. So I'm not convinced that skin fibroblasts in scleroderma are gonna tell us the same thing. And we don't do a lot of scleroderma transplants. We have a handful, but we, we wanna ask that question. Are these cells invasive? Because clearly scleroderma is much more of a global fibrotic disease. Um, but we're hoping, you know, in the years to come to, to delve into that. And the telomerase story is fascinating. So, actually, I just got an, uh, an email this morning from a woman in the UK who, who's just got her TERT mutation back, and should I take these supplements? Crazy. But if you look at the pathway, so um, NAD, this sirtuin pathway is connected to telomerase. And so, it's, so the hypothesis is that if you, if you go on a regenerative program and then three years later, if your telomerase, because these things take a long time, if that sort of gets better, then we were right. But it takes a long, it's really, but that whole telomerase story really fits into this premature aging concept. And a lot, even a lot of the sporadic patients that don't have a, a, tel, a TERT mutation, their, their um, telomerase activity is reduced. This particular person's is at 1%, so that's suboptimal. But would potentially restoring this longevity pathway, if you will, would it potentially have an impact on telomerase uh, activity? I have no idea, but it's interesting to think about. Andy, the one that, the one that got away. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, so I, I was going to ask that question, but the other one that's very fascinating, you mentioned, I'm very well aware of all these people taking NAD that people ask me about it all the time. So what's interesting to me is that I guess, I guess you're going to see, from a metabolic standpoint, you're going to see a whole lot of uh, uh, defective oxidative phosphorylation because you simply don't have enough NAD. It's an NAD required, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. required. Consumer, so, exactly. So I, I imagine you're doing, you're looking at uh, retrograde, trans, uh, retrograde communication between the mitochondria and the nucleus. Do you have data that suggests that there's some sort of program? Yep, there? yep. So when you have this switch in metabolism, this is associated with a, a different transcription factors. Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't show the mitochondria work because I didn't want to put everybody to sleep. But basically, sirtuin-7 in the mitochondria is dramatically regulated by NAMPT. And um, e exactly. And uh, Brian will appreciate I have to start thinking about mitochondria. Claude Panadosi, who is his mentor, was one of the godfathers of mitochondria in the lung. And I do think that, that that's a great, a, a great question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and we're uh, and, and and Peter Chen at our place, who's great friends with Jen, is working on developing that spatial stuff on it, it, you know, and even in the explanted lung, you can find some normal. But I think people are starting to look at that, and my guess is those type two cells are not normal. Exactly, Brian. You guys are lucky to get him. It's a great question we have not looked into. I'm struggling with zinc, much less another other ion, you know, but it's something to definitely think about. Maybe you can help me. Yes, sir. What are the recommend now with all pulmonologists and rheumatologists ready? Well, you'll love this story. I, I was going to be a rheumatologist. I, when I was at NYU, I worked in Steve Abramson's, Jerry Weissman's lab. And then when I went to UCSF and that lupus patient had alveolar hemorrhage, I fell in love with the MICU. So, but I've been fascinated for, for my whole career with this interplay 
Because I do think it's the holy, I mean, this interplay, if we need a, we need a proteomic test we can get, is this person gonna develop RA or Sjogren's? You know, because the lung, it's easy when they, go, when they go to the rheumatologist because they got a big swollen joint. But when they come to us, it's just they all have the same complaint. I get out of breath when I go up the stairs. Well, you know, who doesn't, right? <laughs> Oh, that's John? Oh, my God. I re oh, good to see you again. You're th oh, awesome. <laughs> Listen, whatever you say, I believe. <laughs> this guy's amazing. <laughs> Thank you much.